All right. Thank you so much, everyone who has joined us so far. Welcome back to Astronomy at Home, our second official event. We're so glad you're here. Um, uh, I wanted to let you know that, you know, as our speaker is speaking, you're welcome to add questions to the chat box. And we'll also be answering questions at the end of the talk. Uh, and if you'd like to type those into the chat box, that will always be an option. Uh, you may also, at the end of the talk, raise your hand and we'll unmute you so that you can ask the question directly. All right, and with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker for the night. He is a University of Washington astronomy professor and deputy director of LSST. Please give a warm welcome to Professor Jelko Ivesic. Thank you. Should I begin sharing my screen? Can you hear me? Well, good evening, everyone. I cannot see you. I cannot see most of you, but I can feel the good vibe. I can feel your interest for astronomy. And thank you so much for showing up. So I will spend maybe half an hour going through some slides telling you about what we affectionately call the greatest movie of all time. It's a project that a number of us at the University of Washington, about 20 of us are working on. We've been working on this for more than a decade. And there are about several hundred people in the US and around the world who are hoping to see the first images from that project in a couple of years. So I will switch first to full screen. Does that look better now? So I will split my, my presentation in like four, five, six minutes blocks. I'm going to tell you about why these movies or sky surveys are super cool. And that will be not specific to LSST, but then I will connect to the legacy survey of space and time to LSST. And then I'll take you through the construction of the new observatory we are building to deliver that survey. And then hopefully I'll have a few minutes at the end to just show a few quick slides about machine learning because I anticipate that most of or many of people on this call from Seattle are working in software industry. They are interested in data mining, machine learning. So I'll just give you a few slides that will connect what we do in astronomy with what you may be doing in industrial setting. So there are several ways you can do modern astronomy. If you, if you, let's say, have unlimited amount of funding and you say, what is the best I can do to get some new data that we never had before? One way is to build giant ground-based observatories. And so these two domes show Keck telescopes at Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And these telescopes are, each is having a about 10 meter mirror and soon we'll have telescopes that have mirrors that are 30 to 40 meters. And the main point of building ever larger telescopes, ever larger mirrors, is to collect more photons. And if you collect more photons, you can see fainter and fainter objects. And that, that's especially important if you're doing spectroscopy. And here you can see a spectrum or spectrogram of some object. And all these lines in that spectrum, they're like fingerprints. They're telling us about the chemical composition of the object we are looking at, what that object is, what is the temperature and so on. So even though we cannot travel to these objects, we can look at spectra and learn a lot about them. Another way to do cutting edge astronomy is to send a spacecraft in the orbit around Earth or even further away with a telescope. And the reason why you would do that is twofold and both reasons have to do with the atmosphere on Earth. Atmosphere blurs images from the ground so most big telescopes on the ground have no better resolution than telescope you can buy, uh, buy at Walmart for 200 bucks. But if you send them above the atmosphere, then you can get resolution that is limited only by the size of your mirror. And in addition, atmosphere also absorbs X-rays and infrared radiation, ultraviolet radiation, which is good because we'd be dead if it didn't, but it's also, problem for astronomy, you cannot observe that radiation from the objects. So you have to go above the atmosphere. So, and these are billion dollar projects or more. 
And the third way to do cutting edge astronomy is to do large sky surveys. And that's relatively recent development that was driven by the development of sensor technology, charge couple devices that you have in your smartphones and development of information technology of computers and the ability to process large amounts of data and the ability to make ever larger telescopes with a cost that was not scaling with the size. The big mirror costs the same for last few decades and that's due to development of technology. Even though we are making ever larger mirrors, it's always few tens million, two tens of millions of dollars. So large size sky surveys are different from other telescopes because their purpose is to get as many objects as you can. And today we are actually detecting and measuring billions of objects. So for the first time in history, we can record and analyze as many objects as there are living people on earth and even more. So here is an example from one of these cutting edge surveys that started this new era of digital sky surveys called SDSS. And these are pretty objects. And if you're an astronomer, and even if you're not an astronomer, when you look at these objects, you're owed by the detail and how beautiful they are. But sky surveys are really not about studying an individual object. It's about getting data that look like the following image. So this image is really tiny piece of the sky and I put moon for scale below. So this is about one tenth of the moon's area on the sky of the full moon area. And there are about 100,000 objects in this little patch on the sky. So if you look across the entire sky, you can detect billions of objects. Until recently, we couldn't do it technologically because we could not record and analyze that many objects. But over the last two decades, we came to a level where we can do billions of objects like this. And so what do we do with these images that have so many objects? First, we need to teach computers to go through these images, recognize how many objects we have, all of them individually, just like if you were having census of the country, we have census, census of these images. So computer goes and looks for objects, finds objects as iso isolated bright things, and then analyzes how many photons came from each object, that is to say how bright it is, then how wide it is. And then we take all these measurements and we put it in a database that we call catalog of objects in an image. And then we put these databases in public domain. And again, SDSS was a pioneering survey that about two decades ago obtained the first digital map of the sky, a picture of the sky, analyzed that photograph of the sky for all the objects. They had about 500 million objects. They measured many things for each of these objects. And they put it in this public domain database that now everyone can go to, scientists, but also general public. You can do it as a school teacher. You can do it as an amateur astronomer. You can do it as a citizen. You can get to all this public data and do whatever you please with it. So in astronomy, in professional astronomy, the reason why we produce these catalogs is to study the universe, to study the formation and evolution of the universe, structure formation in the universe, to study evolution of individual objects. So if you have such a catalog, then you can ask various questions that I highlight in blue here. You can be interested in discovering new objects. So you can ask, is this a new asteroid or is it already catalog? If it's a new, maybe you get to name it if that's what you care about. Or you can ask what kind of galaxies exist and how are they related to each other? Just like there are different types of people, you can divide people among, uh, along many axes. You can also divide astrophysical objects along many axes and ask, do I understand evolution of these objects? You can do statistical studies, you can do many interesting things if you have a uniform, unbiased sample of objects. That's why we do surveys. And so over the last two decades, there were a number of surveys that I cannot discuss in detail, but they all together contributed to a major change of paradigm in astronomy. When I was young graduate student, then you had two choices in grad school. You could be theorist or you could be observer. Theorist works with equations, makes new theories, Observer goes to telescope, gets data, and analyzes those data to prove or disprove the theories. 
And over the last two decades, there is this third kind of astronomer today that is very good with software, very good with databases, that takes these public databases and instead, instead of traditional paradigm, when you ask what data do I need to get to test a certain theory, you flip it and you say, given this database, what theories I can test? What measurements can I utilize to prove or disprove something? So I paraphrased one of our presidents, not the current one, but if you're good at history, you'll recognize the top one. Ask not what data you need to do your science, which used to be paradigm, but ask what science you can do with your data. Data that someone else collected in uniform way and put in a giant database. And that's what we want to do with LSST. That's why we are working hard to make the best ever, the largest ever, the greatest ever database of astronomical observations. So given this progress over the last two decades, you may as well ask, well, given this great progress, why do you need now yet another survey? Why do you need yet another billion or more dollars to do it? And so I put this collage of the most exciting astronomical projects that are happening right now. The four big telescopes at the bottom are all ground-based telescopes. The two in the middle are US-led 30-meter telescope and giant mirror telescope, 30-meter diameter of the mirror. The one on the left is extremely large telescope. Yeah, pretty stupid name. Astronomers are not good at getting very good names. Extremely large telescope. There was another one, overwhelmingly large telescope that didn't get funded. So ELT is 40 meter, it's European telescope. And then there are two very exciting space missions, James Webb Space Telescope and Nancy Roman Space Telescope that are both successors to the Hubble Space Telescope that I'm sure you know about. James Webb Telescope is trying to extend Hubble by having larger mirror, six meter mirror instead of 2.5 mirror. And Nancy Roman Space Telescope is trying to extend Hubble by taking much larger field of view, 100 times larger than Hubble. And so these are all many billion dollar instruments. LSST is actually the cheapest, the least expensive on this list, but I don't think it's the least exciting. And the reason why we want LSST is twofold. Before I go to technical reasons, I just want to mention that recently we changed the name of the project. It used to be Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, and we changed the name to the Vera Rubin Observatory. Vera Rubin was an amazing astronomer who passed away three years ago. She is the one who basically convinced everyone that dark matter exists. This is one of the largest puzzles in physics, in astrophysics. It was proposed earlier than Rubin's work, but she was the one whose observations convinced everyone that there was something there, that it wasn't a fluke. And so the observatory itself is named after Vera Rubin, but the first project that the observatory will undertake is called Legacy Survey of Space and Time. So we kept the acronym LSST, but the name of the observatory is different. So why is LSST so special or Rubin Observatory? So we will not have the largest mirror. It will be only eight mirror, eight meter mirror compared to 40 mirror, it's tiny. But what nobody else will have, one thing that is distinctive for LSST is the product of the mirror area and the field of view size. So the other telescopes are like, if you take a piece of paper and you make a really tiny thing and you look at the sky, and this, you see very teeny, tiny portion of the sky. With LSST, we can see 100 times more at any given image than typical telescope. And I'll show you here. This is a slide I stole from my colleague and BFF, Andy Connolly, who gave an excellent TED talk about large surveys. And you may later, if you're interested in surveys, you can search, it, search for it on YouTube. So these red circles are areas covered in one night by our field of view, which is shown as the little white circle on your left, a little, I'm sorry, a little blue circle. And in the middle, not to scale, this little blue circle is now enlarged. And you can see that across it's seven full moon. And you remember image I showed you from SDSS that had 100,000 objects, but it was less than full moon. Here we have an area of about 40 full moon. That's the trade secret. That's the secret of LSST. Go faint by having large mirror. 
and get a huge chunk of the sky observed at any given moment because you have large field of view. And if you can do that, now you can scan the sky rapidly and cover the entire sky. And LSST can cover the whole sky in just three nights of observing. And that's about 100 times faster than any other large telescope. So what would take to other telescopes a year to accomplish, we can do in three nights. And we will do that three nights by three nights by three nights for 10 years. And then we will use that data to be more sensitive than any other sky survey before. And we will compare different nights to see what change on the sky. And that's another major science program for LSSD. So if you can tell what's changing on the sky, one good example of what you can do is to look for killer asteroids. And they are not just stuff from the movies. There is real measurable danger from killer asteroids. And here is one example of a crater in Arizona that happened that happened about 50,000 years ago. And we aim to get a catalog of all the potential killer asteroids that are bigger than limit of 140 meters, which basically translates to limit for regional damage. That's one of the goals. Here are pyramids shown. I have one more American friendly thing. If you've never been to Egypt, it's about eight football fields. So it's a huge hole. If this hits Seattle, we would be in trouble. So that's one practical reason why we want major sky survey like LSST. And there are numerous other reasons that are driven by science. And these slides gives you high level summary of the major science programs we want to undertake. So I just wanted to highlight the question, was Einstein right? What it means is that when we look at observations in astronomy at the largest scales, we need to understand the force of gravity, how gravity behaves. And on the largest scales, its behavior is described by Einstein's theory of relativity. And if you believe theory of relativity is correct, then observations lead you to believe that there is some constituent of the universe that we called, that we named dark energy, that nobody understands what it is. But you must assume it exists to explain observations. The other way to explain observations is to say, well, our theory of gravity is wrong. We just don't understand how gravity behaves on the largest scales. In other words, Einstein's theory of relativity is wrong. So there are these two, at least these two possibilities, we don't know which one is correct. And we hope that data from LSST will be precise enough, powerful enough to tell us which of these two possibilities is closer to the truth. So to summarize this revolutionary step forward with LSST, with this new observing system, here I'm showing one image from SDSS, which is like gold standard today. It's a color image constructed with LSST data. And the size of this image is about one tenth of the full moon's diameter. And it goes to a limit, which is about million times fainter than what your eyes can see on the sky. You couldn't see any of these objects. They're a million times too faint. But now with LSST, we can go even fainter. And so this is what LSST will see. Isn't that amazing? So it's the same region on the sky. This is real image. It's obtained with the Japanese Subaru telescope, which has the same mirror as LSST, but it doesn't have as large field of view. So it can see a small part of the sky as well as LSST, but it doesn't have the power to cover the entire sky. And so going from here to here is what LSST wants to achieve today with LSST. Often when I get tired of work and I want to motivate myself, I just go and flip through these two slides. And then when I get motivated, then I go to Peddler Brewing, I have a pitcher of beer, and then I go back to work. So let me tell you a little bit about the project itself. So it will be in Chile and data will be shipped as soon as we take data, within a few seconds, it will be in Illinois. Those two blue lines that you can see, they are redundant optical fibers that ship the data from Chile, one via Brazil, the other one on the other side, on the west side, they go through Florida and then they go 
to NCSA National Center for Supercomputing Applications in Illinois that will process the data. And then we will distribute data from there to the rest of the world. We started construction about five years ago when we, get, when we received full federal funding. This is me pretending to do useful work. Of course, the safety officer locked all the doors on the machinery before astronomers came because we, they didn't want us to hurt ourselves. So that was just photo op. Then real people started building it, construction company from Chile. A few years later, it grew rapidly, it's six floor building. And this was a year ago, the dome was almost finished. And then the damn virus came and we just needed a few more weeks to finish the dome. But the crew that was completing the dome from Italy, they had to go home. We had to halt everything. And we think now that will be delayed by about a year. So the new dates are that first images will come in 22 and we will enter the full operations in 23. Unfortunately, we lost a year. This is the telescope or telescope mount assembly as it was assembled in Spain in a factory that constructed it. About a year ago, it was disassembled, shipped in pieces to Chile, and all the pieces are now at the summit at the observatory that I just showed you, and it's half assembled. And also the Spanish crew had to go back due to the virus, and we hope they will all come back by the end of this year, hopefully. So now going back to why is LSST powerful? So here I'm comparing two telescopes. Gemini South is also a federal US telescope that is in Chile, few hundred yards from our telescope. They have almost identical mirror, eight meter. But LSST is much more powerful survey instrument because we have much larger field of view. And this giant circle in the bottom right labeled 3.5 degrees. That's how much of the sky we can see in one image. And above it, this tiny circle is what Gemini South can see. So it's 100 times smaller. So what we can do in one night with Gemini South telescope, you'd have to spend 100 nights. That's the key. That's why LSST will be so much powerful. So you can ask, well, why didn't astronomers do that before? What's a big deal? It doesn't seem to be such an ingenious idea that if you look at the bigger part of the sky, you can be done faster. The problem is that if you try to make large field of view, then with classical construction of the telescopes, you have large image distortions. And there is a limit in optics beyond, beyond which you cannot have good image quality, which is important for science. So the reason why LSST can go to the large field of view is three mirror design. It's very unique. It's shown if you look on the, at, the, at the slide on the left. So the bottom is like two mirrors made of one piece of glass. I'll show you the real thing in slider two. And the photons bounce three times. So the angle of bouncing is never too large as it would be with two mirrors. And because these angles are smaller, distortions are smaller and we get better image quality. That's one reason. The second one is when you have this huge field of view, it's very expensive to cover it with sensors. And that was not possible until a decade ago. And I'll show you image of our camera, how many pixels we have. So it is basically the answer to this question, are we smarter than astronomers of 30 years ago? No, we are not smarter, but we do have better technology. They could have not done that 30 years ago that we can do today. And even if they could, even if they could construct this mirror and the camera, they could still not process the data because computers were not that good. So it's all of these things coming together, telescopes and cameras, sensors and software that come together that enable us to do that right now. So that's the mirror that we got it from the oven. It's basically spin casting. You melt the glass, you rotate, and then the free surface becomes parabola, which is what you want. Then you cool it down over a few months, four or five months. And then you get this mirror that looks like on this image. And then you have to polish the inner part. Oh, I forgot to mention, there is great connection to Seattle. This mirror was procured before we had federal funding. And it was procured with gift from Charles Simone and Bill Gates. Of course, you know Bill Gates. You should probably know Charles Simone too. He gave a lot of great gifts to Seattle, including opera and concert halls. And he was the head of the team that produced Microsoft Office software. So we managed to get them before federal funding was in. 
to gift us this mirror so University of Arizona could produce it. This is our mirror being polished. And after it was done, it looked like this. So here, clearly you can see two optical figures. In the outer part, you can see one figure that's primary mirror. In the inner part, you have this stronger figure, which is tertiary mirror. And these two together enable us to have large field of view. Camera itself is technological marvel too. It's amazing. It's as big as an SUV. It has the largest pixel count of any camera ever produced. It's 3,000 megapixels. How do you get to this count? So it has to be modular. So if you look at these red squares, we call them rafts. They have nine sensors. And each sensor is 16 megapixel. It's like very good smartphone. We have 189 of them. And it's all modular. So each one is read out in two seconds, which is amazingly fast for an astronomical camera. So that's the next thing that enables us. First one is very special, unique optical construction. This is the second piece of equipment, very unique camera, the largest camera in the world. And it's so, there are so many pixels that it's hard to convey to people how many pixels is three gigapixels. So if you adjust it, the projection to your eyes, your eyes can do one arc minute resolution. You would have to have for each image that we will get, and we'll get 2 million images like this, you'd have to have 1,500 high definition televisions. And I couldn't find picture of the building with 1,500 televisions, so I had to Photoshop it. But that's how it would look like. And the lenses that we put in this camera are also unique. This, the one that the first lens in our camera is the largest lens ever produced for any purpose anywhere. So it's really technological marvel to have this camera to, to look at the sky. And just a few photographs, just to give you a feel how it looks like to, to assemble such very special, very sensitive instrument. This is clean room at the laboratory called SLAC, used to be Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. Now it's just SLAC. It's operated by Stanford University. And this is where our team is assembling this camera. Here is a picture of the bottom of the camera. This is one of those rafts. Just a few months ago, we completed the camera, the focal plane array. And we were doing testing when we had to shut down due to COVID. So we are not done yet, but it's almost ready to go to Chile. It's very hard to stick these things in. You only have few microns tolerance. You can't do it with your hands. Even if you had two pitchers from Bedlar Brewing and your hands were very steady, still you couldn't do it like with two micron precision. So there are special equipment like this one here that you see in the bottom that then slowly raises this raft up and puts it in the focal plane array. So it's really sensitive procedure that is technological marvel. And the last important component and Show me, Meredith, with your fingers, how many minutes I have left. Do I have five? Five, excellent, so I'm on time. It's very hard to get picture of software. So the reason why we need a lot of software is that we are not only producing images from the camera, we are reducing, processing these images. We are finding objects. We want to find of the other 40 billion objects in these images and not only find them, but to measure their properties very precisely. And that takes a lot of software, a lot of sophisticated statistics and measuring algorithms. And on top of that, we want to serve these results to both scientists and to public so that everyone, just like in case on F SDSS, everyone can get to this data set and enjoy it for scientific or any other reasons. So I just want to point out one aspect of software. This is like our high level diagram. I'm not going to go through each box. My point is it's very complicated. It will be between one and two million lines of new code that we will write. And what I want to point out is one aspect, the aspect that is developed at our host institution, Dirac, at the University of Washington. So what we are doing is so-called image differencing pipeline. And here the idea is that you have two images. You can subtract one from the other in software to get detection of anything that changed on the sky. If you read astronomy books, if you read about discovery of Pluto, about Clyde Tombaugh, 
at Lowell Observatory. That's exactly what he was doing, but he was doing it mechanically. He would make two images of the sky and mechanical thing would flip between these two images. And then you can see things moving. Here we do it with computer. And so in the bottom row, you can see discovery of a new object. So there were two images and the difference shows a single object that wasn't there in image one, but it's there in image two. So that's what we are developing. We call these alerts. We'll report them within 60 seconds. We expect each observing night to have up to 10 million such alerts. Over the life of the survey, we will report 10 billion alerts that other people will then filter for most interesting events and deploy other telescopes like those at the bottom of my slide. So that's the idea. LSST will be like this giant finder scope that will be more powerful for finding new interesting things than any other instrument. But once you focus on it, then you go and deploy other instruments to get other kinds of data and learn more about the most interesting objects that we will be discovering. And lastly, I want just to say a few words for my fellow geeks who are interested in data mining and machine learning. That's what I like to do. So if you think about LSST data set, it's about 40 billion objects and we'll measure them about thousand times, thousand different times we'll look at that object. And if you just assume we'll measure only 10 numbers for each object, we'll measure many more, but let's say 10 and you measure it thousand times, that's 10,000 numbers. So that's a space spanned by 10,000 dimensions and it's populated by 40 billion points. So the plot in the bottom left shows much simpler version of that. It's only three dimensional space and it shows some distributions. There is like donut, used bubble gum, lost tooth, whatever you want to call it. So there are morphologies that you want your computer to recognize and describe. That's what we call classification of new populations and characterization of known objects. And then you want to look for unusual objects. And we all know how to do that. Amazon is doing it every day or Netflix is doing it every day to suggest the movies you would like. What they are not doing is to actually have 10,000 dimensional space with 40 billion points. That's like 100 times more than Americans watching Netflix. So there are interesting technological challenges that are facing us to analyze fully this data set. And so I could show you pictures of galaxies, but I wanted to show you instead picture of sheep. It's easier to relate to sheep. So the question here is, I have this image, where is a weird sheep? And you can think, oh, well, this one with the blue sweater. I would say it's not weird sheep, it's just cold and has, it's a different population of sheep. I'm looking for something much more specific, much, much tinier effect. And I need to process billions of images like that. And the effect I'm looking for is this sheep. You see, one eye is open, the other eye is closed. That's what I want to teach my computer to do for me on billion of images. And the difficulty is I don't know if I will be looking at sheep or donkeys or people or fish. And I don't know what anomaly means. Is it wiggling your tail or missing a foot or having closed eye? So that's the challenge that we need to develop to process fully the data. So I will stop here. I hope some of you are still awake. Uh, there are a few thoughts at the last slide. If you thought this was interesting and you want much more technical and deeper description of LSST, you can go to this link in the top left, ls.st, L-O-P for LSST over your paper. It's a professional paper about 30 pages long where you can get solid information about the project. So if there is anything I would like you to remember from this talk tonight, it is that today astronomers are observing and measuring and studying tens of billions of objects. We are studying more objects than there are living people on earth. This has not happened ever before. And because of the development of technology, including computers and sensors, today we are playing with more celestial objects than there are living people on earth. That's my last thought. And now I would be happy to take your questions. Thank you so much, Yoko. I know there's only a few of us that can unmute ourselves, but imagine, imagine the chorus of, of cheers and adulation that we are. Thank you. Caring for you. Um, 
Yeah, so we have plenty of time for questions. If you'd like to add those uh, to the chat now, or uh, we can kind of see if I can see more. Uh, Should I stop sharing? Um, that's up to you. There might be questions that uh, you might want to go back to slides, but but you you can always okay. choose to start sharing again if you'd like to be able to see our beautiful audience. I was wondering if I could see people asking questions if I stop sharing. Yes, you should be able to do that. I'll do that. Great. Uh, so we're going to keep an eye on, you should have the option down at the bottom to raise your hand. Um, so you're welcome to do that or you're welcome to put a question in the chat. Uh, we already have one uh, question in the chat as well as uh, complimenting some of the beer options that we've been seeing in the video images. Uh, but Matthew Karasu asks, what is the size of data sets that we can download for our analysis? And what kind of processing power would we need to achieve results in a day? Oh, it's a three-parter. And what is the software scientist you use Oh, what is the software that scientists use to analyze data and look for correlations? Okay, so there are different answers whether the question is about the existing data sets like SDSS or about future in few years about LSST data set. So should I answer both or can I get clarification for existing data sets? Okay, Matthew says existing data sets. So with SDSS, the total imaging data set is about 30 terabytes. But if you look at catalogs, it comes down to perhaps eight terabyte or so, one terabyte. With LSST, we'll get 30 terabytes per night. Our total imaging data set will be about 60 petabytes. With metadata and post-processing and so on, we need to budget for about 500 petabytes of data. But going back to SDSS and database, there you have database, you can run structured, structured query language, SQL, and you don't have to download the entire data set on your computer unless you want to reprocess individual images. In this case, the upper limit is 30 terabytes. But you can get away with much smaller data sets if you are doing something more specific. I hope this, this gets in the direction of what you wanted to learn. If I didn't answer it correctly, please, to ask for clarification. He says, thank you. Uh, all right, we'll move on. Hendrik has a question. Do we have a good chance of finding more planets in our solar system with LSST? We hope so. So there is this planet X that you must have heard of. So Pluto was demoted. So now we have eight planets. But we believe that the night planet could exist based on the motions of so-called Kuiper belt objects or trans-Neptunian objects that go around the sun at distances beyond Neptune, roughly like Pluto. And if you look at some of them, they have coherent orbits that indicate that there could be a large planet like Neptune further out so that nobody discovered it yet. The problem is nobody can predict where exactly in its orbit. We know roughly what could the orbit be, but we don't know where exactly to look. And because it's faint, you basically need to scan the whole sky to very faint limit. And that's the other name for LSST. LSST is the only survey that can go faint across the large chunk of the sky. So maybe someone will discover this planet before LSST if it's bright enough. Maybe LSST will discover it if its brightness is fainter than what we can today. And if it's really tiny, maybe not even LSST will discover it. But if it were, if it were very tiny, we would not see dynamical effects on those Kuiper belt objects that we see. So I'm very, very, very hopeful that after a year or two that LSST is in operation, we will discover that new planet and everybody will be talking about it and we'll be so happy. And you'll remember this Zoom call and you'll say, yes, I've heard about that. I, I hope that is true as well. Um, okay, uh, Thomas, oh wait, uh, sorry, Larry asks, 
You said LSST was looking for dark matter confirmation. What is the connection to dark matter? So dark matter shows itself only through gravity. You cannot detect it through photons. You don't see it. But you need to see some influence through gravitational force of that invisible matter on nearby matter. And so there are several methods how we can do it. The most precise one for cosmology is the impact of dark matter on the shapes of galaxies. So if you take flashlight and you point it to something, that light will go in a straight path. But it's only in everyday life because there is nothing dense enough to bend it. But in reality, according to theory of relativity, when light travels close to a very dense object like my head, if it was much denser than it is, the light would bend around my head. And so it would be like a lens. And that's why we call it gravitational lensing. And so if there is invisible matter around galaxies, the shapes of galaxies will be distorted. Now, galaxies are not perfect spheres. Like if you look at cows and chicken, they're perfectly round, right? But galaxies are not. So the only way to get ahead is to observe many galaxies and then average in one part of the sky and then on average, if there is no gravitational lensing, you will get spherical chicken or spherical cow. If there is gravitational lensing, there will be still distortion. And that's what we are after. But to do that, you need billions of galaxies because you are averaging a lot. And you need to have very precise instrument, very good image quality. So that's one way how LSST will provide excellent measurements of dark matter. Another way is to look in our own galaxy to look at the motion of stars. And those motions of stars depend on gravitational potential, gravity that they feel. We can get gravity from the visible stars. And if the implied gravity by the motions of stars is different, then this discrepancy we interpret as due to dark matter. And that's another very good way to constrain dark matter distribution. So that's the, the two leading ways. All right, on to our next question. Uh, Thomas Waters asks, I noticed on one of the slides that the mirror size was listed as 8.4 meters with 6.7 meters effective. Does this mean that we are effectively only collecting data for photons that strike that 6.7 meters? Right, as you remember, our mirror is made of one piece of glass, but only the outer part is collecting photons first time. Then it goes up, then it comes down and the inner part is the tertiary mirror. So you only need to take area of the outer annulus and it, the outer radius is 8.4 meters. The inner radius is five meters. So you can easily calculate the area and you ask what would be the effective diameter that would give me the same area if I had perfect circle. So that perfect circle would be 6.7 meter diameter, but it's really outer edges 84. 8.4 meters, and then I have to subtract the hole in the middle. So I have a question from over on the YouTube chat. Um, the Trisha asks, are images getting noisier with increasing numbers of satellites and debris? What a perfect leading question for two weeks from now. That's right. We will have a fantastic presentation that I've already seen. So with full authority, invested in me. I'm saying it's going to be fantastic. It will be delivered by Meredith. And the short answer is yes, we will be affected. It will not be every single pixel that will be affected, but there will be fraction of pixels that might even be totally rendered useless. And I invite you to attend Meredith's talk in a few weeks. She's expert on it. She studied existing observations of satellite trails by existing telescopes and did very detailed analysis and she understands many of those aspects and she will present on this in this series in a few weeks. All right, another one from Zoom. Kevin asks, can we learn about anything about the origin of the universe with this data set? Depends, uh, what do you mean by the origin? If you're talking about the very, first few seconds of the universe, Big Bang, then we cannot say anything directly 
because you really need to observe in microwaves to observe microwave background to directly probe that. But indirectly, we can surely tell you a lot about evolution of the universe from measuring the expansion of the universe through supernovae, through weak lensing, growth of structure through weak lensing, and by constraining the properties of dark energy and ultimately answering, is there really evidence for dark energy or is it perhaps that the theory of gravity is not correct? So it's like, we cannot tell you, we don't have pictures of the baby in hospital when it was born, but we will have pictures of that baby after it left hospital all the way until it became an old man or woman. All right, and it looks like what might be our last question, unless there's anything more from YouTube. Uh, Krista Lemius asks, I was under the impression that the amount of data from LSST would outstrip even the large, largest data centers due to the sheer volume of data collected. Am I mistaken or has this been solved? So 10 years ago, it looked like 100 petabyte data set was really scary. By now, it's not scary, as scary as it used to be. All the major internet providers like Google, Amazon, they are already handling 100 petabyte data sets. Of course, they have much more funds than we do, but also we will not collect 100 petabytes on the first night. We will get to 100 petabytes level after many years. And so we don't think it will be a major problem. We do have to design special data center for handling our data, but it's handleable with, with finite amount of funds that we can get as a science project. It won't be easy, but it's doable. It is not a risk for the project that we will not be able to do it. All right, I think that's all of the questions. Um, I don't see any other last hands. Uh, so uh, we're gonna go ahead and end our talk for the night. Maybe one more virtual round of applause for our speakers, Yelko. Um, and uh, if you if you've seen our poster, if you were here the la you know for our first event, you'll know that we're gonna have an Instagram live uh, interview with Yelko uh, just after this. We're gonna start uh, closer to nine, so we can give our speaker a little bit of a reprieve between now and then. Uh, but please join us at AOT Seattle. I'll put it in the chat as well on Instagram uh, and add any extra questions that might bring to your heart that may or may not have to do with this talk at all. But thank you so much and we'll see you Thanks, in- Thanks everyone. Thanks for coming.